welcome back to another Nature's Tales video. Today I am going to be talking about frogs, thanks to a request from my friend Lulu. The topic of frogs is a pretty large one to say the least, so for this video I am going to be focusing on the diversity seen in frog species as well as talking about some of the threats they face. Frogs are part of the order Anura, a word which originates from ancient Greek meaning without tail. The first frog-like species to be identified was Triana patricius, an amphibian with fossil evidence dating back to the Triassic period, about 250 million years ago. Since then, frogs have diversified massively and now there are about 7,000 species which exist today and they are expanded across all continents except for Antarctica. Because frogs are so widespread and they require specific environmental conditions in order to reproduce and breathe, they are often indicator species. This means that scientists will often measure their populations and health in order to see how the area is doing. Despite the incredible diversity seen in frogs, there are some shared characteristics that they all have. These include the number of vertebra, a lack of a tail, a long ilium which slopes forwards, and its lymph spaces underneath the skin, as well as several other anatomical features. Though there are these similarities, there are also plenty more differences. Frogs vary massively in their coloration, patterns, young bearing, parental care, calls, and so much more. One of my favourite groups of frogs are the tree frogs, and they have members spread across many different families. The similarity shared between all of these species is that they are arboreal, they live in trees. One species I particularly love is the Amazon milk frog, which, as you can probably guess from its name, lives in the Amazon. These creatures are beautifully coloured in shades of green, blue and brown, and they spend most of their lives up in the canopy, living in water-filled holes in trees. The other part of their name, milk, is accredited to the poisonous milky substance that they produce when put under stress. The Amazon milk frog can grow to about 4 inches in size, which is quite a decent size for a frog, especially when you compare it to many of the other species that live in the Amazon, such as poison dart frogs. These tiny beauties only grow to be about an inch and a half, but with their tiny size comes tremendous power. Their bright colours are a warning to predators that they are filled with poison that can paralyse or even kill anything that eats them. There are a few different species of poison dart frog, including the green and black, the yellow banded, the yellow striped, the dying and the rock stone. The size of the species and the habitats in which they reside makes the poison dart frog quite an elusive species, especially the rock stone. The rock stone poison dart frog is endemic to Guyana in South America, meaning that it only occurs in that particular place. In fact, this species is so elusive that I could only find pictures of it in one paper, which was a description of the species based on a preserved specimen found in the 1980s. There are, however, frogs which are significantly easier to find, and some of which have got so widespread that they are now invasive species. Here in the UK we have one native species of frog, the common frog, however we now have the marsh frog here as well which is an alien invasive species. It was initially brought over from Hungary to Kent in the 1930s and their population expanded widely so they were spread about the country more in the 1970s. Since then they've now spread all over the south of England, spreading from Cornwall all the way to Norfolk. The marsh frog is harmful to our native common frog as it creates competition for habitat and food, it predates on the common frog, and it also leads to the spread of chytrid fungus, which has been particularly harmful to frogs all over the world. Which leads on to my next topic in the video, the decline of frogs. Chytrid fungus is the common name given to a fungus that has been causing chytridiomycosis, a disease that has been raging rampant on frogs throughout the world for many, many years. Chytridiomycosis was first identified in 1998, however it has been around for significantly longer than that. Specimens of frogs collected since the mid-1800s have been studied for the presence of chytrid fungus, and the earliest case of chytridiomycosis found on a frog was from a water frog collected in 1863. So how does this fungal disease cause harm to frogs? Chytridiomycosis is a waterborne disease, and the zoospores will move through the water via flagellum. Once the zoospores come into contact with a frog host, they will form spore-creating organs known as sporangia within the epidermis layer of the frog's skin. This will create more zoospores which will be released back into the environment where they can survive without a host for 24 hours. The disease almost always causes a thickening of the epidermis, known as hyperkeratosis, but it can also form ulcers in the skin as well as altering behaviour. As I mentioned earlier, frogs breathe through their skin, and this is why chytrid fungus has such a high lethality rate in frogs. By altering the thickness of the frog's skin, chytrid fungus reduces the ability for a frog to effectively transport water and oxygen into the body and remove harmful toxins from their body. Studies have also shown that chytrid fungus may also impact the immune system of frogs, preventing the production of lymphocytes and also inducing apoptosis, also known as cell death. Overall, it's an incredibly fast-acting, 
highly infectious and very vicious disease that can wipe out many frogs from an area. What makes chytrid fungus much worse is that deforestation is incredibly common in the areas that frogs inhabit. Frogs are found in many rainforest and wetland areas, which are commonly encroached on by human development. When the habitat size is reduced, the frogs are forced into a smaller area, therefore increasing the community density which makes it easier for the disease to spread. Hundreds of frog species are believed to have gone extinct in the 150 years or so that chytridiomycosis has been infecting frogs, and it's only been worsened by habitat loss caused by human expansion. At present, there isn't much that can be done to help reduce the numbers of frogs lost. If a frog is found early enough into their infection, the fungus can be treated, however that frog cannot be re-released back into the environment because they can be reinfected with chytrid fungus. Ex situ conservation is being attempted through breeding programs, and although this doesn't stop the spread of disease, it does help make sure that the populations are not going extinct. Although this has taken a bit of a pessimistic turn from the start of the video, there is still things that we can do in our everyday lives to help reduce the loss of frogs. By spreading awareness, reducing our electricity usage, and making a conscious effort not to buy as many palm oil products, we can help reduce some of the factors that lead to deforestation. This therefore helps in reducing the amount of habitat loss for frogs, and therefore helps prevent the spread of chytrid fungus. Thank you for watching my video today. Just to let you know that I now have a Discord server set up, so if you want to come along and ask questions, request videos, share your nature pictures, or just talk science with other people who have shared interests, then make sure you're checking that link out in the description below to come and join the server. I hope you enjoyed this video today, and don't forget to check out some of my other videos, as well as like and subscribe if you'd like to learn more.